I'm a professor here and the director of the New Economy Law Center. And happy to have everyone here to the final um, event in our series this fall on transforming corporations. The first event in September was uh, all focused on corporations' impact, positive and negative, on climate change and climate, how to move us beyond. Uh, the, and the second piece that came in October was the corporate role in politics. That was right before the midterms, and we talked about corporate personhood and what that meant for our politics. And now, in this final one, we're going to be talking about transforming uh, the corporation in, and transforming our economy. So why this focus on corporations and on the economy? We're all aware of the climate crisis and the urgent need to transition our economy off of fossil fuels. And in addition, we have a major issue with structural poverty in the United States. Real wages have increased only a trivial amount over the past 30 years, while investment income has soared. And so we now have nearly 40 million Americans today who live in poverty. Today's problems are urgent and looming, and they're calling us to work differently and to focus on changes to our systems. And that's what the New Economy Law Center is focused on. We're building a more inclusive, democratic, sustainable, and just society uh, through our educational events and um, uh, classes and ways of bringing people together. So we believe we can reorient the economy. And our current economy is not something that has just happened by chance, but it's a product of design. Our speaker tonight is going to focus on how to redesign it for a more democratic, uh, for more democratic outcomes, and sharing wealth more broadly. So I'm very pleased to now turn to introducing Marjorie Kelly, our speaker tonight. She's the senior fellow and executive vice president of the Democracy, Democracy Collaborative. She has built a career around a more inclusive model for wealth and for ownership. And she's going to share some of those insights with us tonight. She's also an associate fellow at the Telus Institute, a 35-year-old nonprofit that's based in Boston. And she advises a wide variety of businesses and uh, university institutions on ownership and capital design for social mission. In addition, she's authored many reports and books on this topic. Uh, in 2012, she came out with Owning Our Future, The Emerging Ownership Revolution. And just last week, she finished her latest book called The Making of a Democratic Economy. And that will be available this summer, so keep it in mind. Please join me in welcoming Marjorie Kelly. Miracle, it's on. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for turning out on this on this cold night. It's um, thank you, Melissa, for those kind words. I also want to thank Gus Beth for helping to arrange bringing me here tonight. Gus, an old old friend. So uh, it doesn't take much to get me to Vermont. I always love an excuse uh, coming here. I have to stock up on that good maple whiskey cabin fever, which you can only get here. You can't get that in Boston. And um, the people are nice, too. Um, so uh, it's great to be here. And you know, I wish that it was uh, a, possibly a lighter time for being here. Uh, you know, it was just last week we saw the Attorney General of the US fired and um, over 1,000 protests around the country, including one in, in my hometown of Salem, Massachusetts. And, um, uh, uh, but I, I will say that not all the news in uh, my hometown is grim. There are some other headlines uh, that I like to, to capture and keep in mind what matters, um, traffic jams, and so on. <clears throat> so from one small town to another, it's good to be here. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting time to be in a law school. I know 
that uh, some of you are working on masters, some of you are working on law degrees. Uh, I, I, as Melissa said, I do work in ownership and financial design for mission. I'm an English major, <laughs> and I, I, I have a, a degree in uh, journalism as well. So you can come at this work from many different kinds of areas. Now, so when I say it's an interesting time to be in a law school, you know, it's an, it's an old Chinese curse. Uh, may you live in interesting times. Uh, I think we might wish things were a little less interesting. But um, it's an exciting time as well, and I think to be working on the redesign of our economy. Uh, resistance is so vital, but I think we know that it's, it's not enough. My colleague, Gar Alperbitz, who's the co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative, he says, um, we must be unafraid of real ambition. And I, I suspect I'm talking to the right room uh, in saying that kind of, of sentence. And as Gar says, you know, there's going to be a moment when Trump is gone. And the question is, are we ready? Do we know what it is that we really want? What kind of economy do we really think we ought to have? Now, this is not a question only for Democrats. Uh, Republicans also, when we work all over the country, we're a staff of about 35. We work in, in lots of beaten down communities. And uh, we find this work crosses the aisle, that people want a better economy for all of us. <clears throat> so um, it's important, I think, that we recognize out loud that what's underway is so much deeper than who's in the Oval Office right now. So it's a time of deep redesign of what we're doing as an economy. I read this interesting book, How Will Capitalism End? Wolfgang Streak. Uh, he says, we're witnessing capitalism disintegrating before our eyes. And if that's, if that's true, why is there new, not a new social order waiting to replace it? He says there's two missing elements. One is we need uh, new elites who are willing to design and then install a new social order. And we need uh, a shared vision about what it is that we want. <clears throat> so um, as Melissa said, I've just finished a new book my colleague Ted, and How Ted Howard and I are working on uh, just last Thursday. I actually sent it into the publisher. Um, and um, so I'm trying out some of the ideas here tonight that we're talking about. But we believe that we're potentially in the passage from one kind of economy to another from an economy for the few to one for the many. And we call them an extractive economy and a democratic economy. Now, I don't want to say, obviously, this is not um, guaranteed, right? I mean, the odds are against making this passage. But, but what I would suggest is we have two, uh, let's call them secret weapons. Um, one of them is imagination, and the other is legitimacy. I think it's important to remember that we, the people, hold, hold the legitimacy in our hands. And when a system loses its legitimacy, that's the beginning of a very profound change. We're seeing this with Black Lives Matter. We're seeing this with Me Too. So legitimacy, that's a tool that I think we're not using as much as we could. So what do I mean by an extractive economy? It's an economy designed for maximum financial extraction by an elite and uh, heedless of, of who's damaged along the way, employees, communities, the environment. A democratic economy is designed to meet the needs of all persons and to, to work with the regenerative capacity of the earth and to be responsive to ordinary people. Pretty simple, uh, pretty simple concepts. We see this new economy rising all around us. We, think, we see people instinctively knowing what it is that needs to be to be done and taking it up community by community. So what we're trying to do is say, this really is a coherent system that's, that's emerging. So we want to name it and, and shine a light on it. And if there's one lesson that I want you to take away tonight, this is it, that this work needs you. I, I think that we're in a process of redesign. And I think that you're in a really good spot uh, to be leading some of this work and finding your niche within it. <clears throat> so working for a democratic economy, it's a very different approach to social change. Um, you know, for decades, we've been looking at uh, regulation and social safety nets. And this is work about assets and institutions. 
So let me give you an idea of, of what, I, what I mean. So let's, let's take, for example, the idea of universal basic income, right? This is a very a big idea right now. It, it's, it's thought of as this big new idea. Um, I would suggest it's actually a big old idea. That it's the idea of the social safety net taken to a logical extreme. So everyone is going to get a government check. We've done work on Pine Ridge uh, Indian Reservation in South Dakota. There's about 80% unemployment there. Everybody is dependent on a government check. And I'll tell you, it's not a pretty picture. There's, there's rampant alcoholism, there's high suicide rates. Uh, this is not the kind of society that we should hold up as our, as our fondest goal and our grandest dream. There's also something else arising on Pine Ridge. I've had the good fortune for five years to work with this young man, Nick Tilson. Um, and uh, Nick, um, we, we did a learning action lab helping Native American uh, communities get some different kind of e economic work going on. Nick is a fascinating guy. Um, a number of years back, he got together with other youth on Pine Ridge, and they began reviving traditional spiritual practices. Some of these had been illegal until the 1970s. They're doing sweat lodges, they're doing sun dances. And Nick says, um, in these ceremonies, they got a message from the elders. And they said, how long will you allow other people to determine the fate of your children? Are you not warriors? And out of this, Nick said, they realized, uh, they decided to form the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. Um, they bought 34 acres. They're now building a regenerative community on this site. It's uh, causing quite a sensation. These drawings uh, were done by a leading green architect that Nick, Nick has this amazing ability to, to bring people in, into his circle. Um, these drawings also, for a time, uh, were hung in the Cooper Hewitt uh, Design Museum in Manhattan. I, I had the good fortune, fortune of seeing them. Um, and um, so what they're doing on, uh, now this is a, dra a drawing of what it will be. It's just begun. I think they have 13 houses being built. But what they're doing as they build these houses, um, they're also training youth in construction skills. And they're starting an employee-owned construction company. Rather than having just white companies come in and get all, all, the, all the profits, they're saying, no, let's keep that wealth for ourselves. Let's keep that wealth local. Uh, and um, so uh, they're also starting a women-owned uh, quilting cooperative, uh, <clears throat> which I wouldn't put the name up here because I can't pronounce it. But um, <clears throat> so they're, they're, they're um, and I'm going to put their uh, link here in case anybody's looking for Christmas uh, present ideas. Um, I bought one of these quilts myself. But so what they're doing on Pine Ridge is uh, it's economic development that's developing many kinds of wealth, youth skills, community connections, family assets, uh, and it's wealth that is going to stay local. So. Um, what we see on Pine Ridge is the principle of community. Uh, when we work around the country, we call our, our version of economic development community wealth building. And what Native have, have told us is that it's, it's uh, organically an indigenous uh, model. They said what you all call a new economy is really about remembering what our ancestors always knew. And in fact, we, we have a new report coming out. Some of the uh, participants from Pine Ridge uh, took our work of community wealth building and they translated it into Lakota. And we'll, we'll be publishing a report uh, soon. I, I think that's one of the proudest things uh, that I've seen is that this work um, speaks to them just organically. So um, building a democratic economy, it begins with building community wealth. It begins from the ground up, taking care of those in our own communities. <clears throat> and you know, it's a very different thing, instead of thinking about reducing poverty, to think about building wealth. Possessing assets is very different from receiving social services. People feel very different. These youth 
um, when they own a piece of a company, when people own their own home. It's a very different kind of feeling. <clears throat> so that's one example of how this is a different approach to social change. Here's another. It's not just about a higher minimum wage. Heaven knows we need a higher minimum wage, right? But it, it's also about a bigger vision of a worker-centered economy. You know, mostly we don't even dare to dream of such a thing. I, I had an uh, opportunity to visit um, cooperative home care associates uh, in, in uh, the Bronx, which is a, a worker-centered um, company, and doing something very, very different there. So, so a minimum wage, you know, it doesn't mean a whole lot if you work for Uber. There was a study, uh, a government study a few years back, they found 40% of jobs are now part-time, temporary, contingent. Basically, jobs are going away. You have contracts now. You have, you have uh, part-time things, and you're on your own. Um, and that's not something that's going to be solved with a minimum wage, because the issue is asset ownership. The 1% owns more than twice as much wealth as the bottom, 90%. And if we don't get to that, if we don't start to change that, we're not going to change anything. So Cooperative Home Care Associates, this is a company that's been around uh, more than 30 years. Um, they, uh, it's 100% owned by its workers. There's 2,100 people who work there. And they consider themselves a worker-centered company. Their mission is uh, to create better quality care by creating uh, better quality jobs. And these are, these are low-income women, uh, mostly women of color, they're going into the homes of the disabled and, um, um, and elderly people and helping to care for them. And, uh, but these are jobs uh, with dignity, and these are jobs um, where, where women are developing capabilities. They're coming off of, of unemployment and, and getting into these, into these jobs. So, um, so I want to talk for a second about how that kind of approach is very different from uh, the extractive economy that we have today, where bias against workers is built into financial statements. When, it, when you look at an income statement, it tells you that uh, income to workers is defined as a cost. Costs are to be driven down. Income to capital is defined as profit. Profit is to be driven up. And, and this is uh, designed into the basic um, um, financial statement. We see the same thing in investments. If you, if you have $2 billion and you got a 7% return next year, well, you need 7% return next year uh, you know, and the year after that. that there's, there's no point at which any amount of investment income is ever enough. This is the process that is systematically driving um, uh, labor income out of our economy. So a democratic economy has a principle of good work. Um, it's, it's an economy where labor comes before capital. I like to pause when I say that. It kind of makes me want to smile or laugh or something. I mean, can we imagine an economy where labor comes before capital? You know, why is it that we're not even, even dreaming of this? Um, and this is a cooperative home care associates a place where um, they see work as a, as a way to develop human capabilities. Pine Ridge, Cooperative Home Care Associates, we also see principle of inclusion. These are, these are all uh, companies built to include uh, and work for the disadvantaged. Most of our work is in disadvantaged communities. Here's another model uh, for a democratic economy. How many people here have heard of the Bank of, of North Dakota? I was curious if that's very well known. It's not, it's not that well known. It's, um, it's about 100 years old. It's owned by the state of North Dakota. Its mission is to serve the people of North Dakota, not to extract maximum profits from them. And this bank supports a whole network of community-owned, locally-owned banks. And because of it, there's about six times as many of those in, uh, in North Dakota. Elsewhere, all the banks have been rolled up into about five big banks. <clears throat> this bank helped North Dakota get through the 2008 downturn pretty much unscathed. And it's created a movement for, for state-owned and city-owned banks around the country. Lots of cities and states are looking at these. 
here we see a principle of ethical finance where profit is not the aim, but it's the result when you work for, for people and planet. So for a, a note about this, these principles that I keep putting up here, this book that I'm doing with Ted Howard, um, our, our perception is that the work of redesigning an economy, it doesn't begin with little detailed blueprints or, 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 or even legal formulations. It begins with first principles. What are the first principles of what we're talking about? So we're trying to uh, articulate those. I, principle of sustainability is clearly one, because um, we know that the ecosystem becomes, uh, comes before everything else. And you know, it's interesting when, when those of us who are environmentalists tend to talk to companies about sustainability, we tend to make the business case. We want to say, here's how you're going to make more profits by being sustainable. There was a study by MIT uh, a number of years back, and they found uh, that the business case proved true for only 37% of companies. So two-thirds of the time, there is no business case, even for those companies who go out and look for it. Sustainability requires a moral case. You need, it requires moral decision making, and that's what's missing. And George Lakoff is, is a linguist, um, and he says, when you invoke the frame, you reinforce the frame. So when we are always telling companies, you're going to make more profits by being sustainable, we're basically saying to them, it's OK that all you care about is profits. It's OK that maximizing profits is your first principle. And my guess is that we're not going to get to a sustainable economy if we keep saying that. We need to also make the moral case. Um, so um, bias against the, the environment in the extractive economy is built into the financial statements in the same way that bias against labor is. Let's say that you have a stream, and it's damaged by mountaintop removal of coal. Well, that damage is off screen to the balance sheet. That stream is not an asset of the mining company. So if you damage it, you don't have to write it off. It's not considered material. Material is another word for real. So in the lens of corporations, uh, when you have a uh, share price go up, and it might evaporate tomorrow, that's real. When you have a stream that has flowed for millions of years and will never flow again, that's not real. There's a very different principle that Aldo Leopold said. He said, a thing is right when it enhances the stability and beauty of the total ecosystem. It's wrong when it damages it. You know, it's interesting to think back to the founding generation of America. Um, they didn't say democracy uh, to the king is going to make, make the king happier. They said, uh, here are some truths that we hold to be self-evident. I think that's what Leopold is saying, that, that, that rather than fitting ourselves into the, the frame of profit maximization, he's saying, no, this is the first principle. Everything else has to fit itself within this frame. I think uh, too often with, um, with sustainability that we're, we're, we're functioning unconsciously with a, a frame of, well, it's going to be capitalism plus green technology. We're going to have wind, we're going to have solar, and, and so forth. But um, I, I think that, that what we're seeing with Trump and with the Brexit vote, uh, we're seeing desperate people saying that we really feel left behind. And we're not, gonna, we're not gonna care about anything else until we hear that, that we matter. 47% of Americans can't put together $400 in the face of an emergency. I think that's an extraordinary um, fact. I mean, you know, you can think of a million reasons why somebody would need $400, right? I mean, maybe your child breaks an ankle, you, you have a flat tire, you need to buy a school band uniform, and you just can't do it. Almost half of Americans can't come up with it. I mean, th that would leave you, I think, in a state of just constant financial anxiety. If, for, for most of Americans, for most of our friends and neighbors, you know, the, the catastrophe is not 12 years from now. 
with global warming. The catastrophe is right now. And I think until we begin to uh, knit together um, <clears throat> a democratic economy and how it works within planetary boundaries, I, I think that um, we're not going to see concern for climate change, which we know is so urgent. Uh, Martin Luther King said it well. He said, we're woven together in an inescapable network of mutuality and tied into a single garment of destiny. Um, you know, as you go forward in, uh, in your work, I think that um, looking for your place in this work of redesign is, um, is what we're called to. Uh, and, and Melissa suggested that we're, we're here talking about redesigning the corporation. So, so here's a final principle uh, that I want to talk about, which we call democratic ownership. This is a lot of where uh, my work is right now, creating enterprise designs for a new era. Um, we've gotten a little bit of grant money to look at well, how does employee ownership work with ecological sustainability? And um, we've been finding these companies uh, the most exciting are employee-owned B corporations or benefit corporations. And uh, this one here is New Belgium Brewing. Vermont has a number of these. Uh, King Arthur Flower, um, uh, Gardner Supply. We think this is a great model for next generation enterprise design. These are companies that have a built-in concern for the common good and ownership broadly held. <clears throat> Uh, a lot of my work right now is focused on employee ownership. We think this is the democratic model most ready for scale. In fact, there's, there's more than 2 million businesses that will be coming on the market in the next decade. Um, very few will go to their, their founder's offspring. Many will close. This is a chance to have more employee ownership. In fact, just yesterday, uh, we announced the launch of the Fund for Employee Ownership. We're working with the Evergreen Cooperatives in Cleveland to create a fund to buy companies and convert them to employee ownership. <clears throat> so um, deep redesign. I think that's, I think that's uh, the work ahead and uh, the work that, that you'll be finding, hopefully, your place in. I'd like to toss out one idea. We're here at a law school. Um, you know, the iconic court case that says corporations shall be operated for their shareholders, that was Dodge v. Ford. That will be 100 years old next year. It is literally from the horse and buggy era. It's from a time when most Americans did not have electricity. Uh, penicillin had not been invented. Women did not have the vote. Is this still the, the, the principle that should be guiding the most powerful institutions of our country? And what do we do about it? I, I'd love to see what a law school would have to, to say about that um, anniversary. So I want to close uh, with a statement by W.E.B. Du Bois, an African-American uh, scholar and writer who I admire a great deal. And he says, there are historical times that are ripe for change, plastic moments when it becomes possible to remake the world. The cost of missing such a moment is tallied in the blood and suffering of subsequent generations who pay for this failure. So we stand at this moment of redesign, and I think all of us uh, are searching our place in it. And I, I wish for you that you will find yours. Thank you. Comments, questions, doesn't have to be questions. How many people here have studied Dodge v. Ford? Is that, a, is that a court case that people are familiar with? Oh, that's interesting. Why don't, why don't you give the thumbnail? Yeah, well, Dodge v. Ford, um, uh, 
I guess it was Henry Ford who said, I, I want to pay a higher wage to my employees so they can buy my cars. And uh, the Dodge brothers sued and said, no can do. Um, you, you exist to serve your shareholders. And the court, Michigan Supreme Court said, yeah, a corporation shall exist to serve its shareholders. And that's uh, the iconic case that's always cited. Um, inexplicably, it's become the law of the land. We have some questions. Great. Um, hi, my name is Cal Brown. I'm a uh, Merle here, um, master's student. Um, so you talked about the cooperative model. Mm -hmm. um, typically, we think of tension between uh, management and labor. Would you say that this is collapsing that tension, that you kind of fold them into one unit? You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, not necessarily. I think what it does is it says that, that the interests of the corporation and the interests of the workers are one and the same. Um, I, I think even within that, it, you have, um, there still can be a tension between management and labor. There can be tension in a nonprofit between management and labor. Uh, and so y there's a difference between governance. Ownership and governance are kind of at a higher level, at kind of a meta level, the, the container of a, of a company. And then management is what happens within it. <clears throat> For example, Cooperative Home Care Associates, they talked to me about, um, you know, when they said, okay, w when they tell people we're employee owned, employees sometimes misunderstand that and think, oh, well, we get to make the decisions now. <laughs> or we get to stay home when we don't feel like working. And they have to say, well, no, that's not what employee ownership means. Uh, and so they have a, a management labor committee where disputes are, are, are resolved. So, th so, so you still can have disputes, uh, but, but yes, what you're pointing to is uh, there's still nuance there. It doesn't really collapse. Thank you for that. Hi, uh, thank you for being here. My name is Adam McGovern. I'm a master's student as well, um, but I'm also a small business owner. Uh huh. I employ about 15 people in uh, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I would love to maximize our profits significantly more than they are. Um, not just for myself, but also for the people who work there. Uh -huh. So we can hire more people, so we can pay them more than they're currently paid, so we can improve the quality of our product and service. Sure. Um, and I understand a lot of what you've said applies to mid-size and larger businesses, but yeah. I'm curious what sort of advice you have for me and for small business owners generally. Yeah, well, I'll say that um, I was the co-founder of uh, Business Ethics Magazine. I was a small for-profit company, which I ran for 20 years. And <clears throat> when I uh, went into that business, uh, my partner and I had what we call a conversion experience. I became fanatical about revenue, <laughs> that you need revenue. You need more money coming in than going out. Uh, that's absolutely the lifeblood of any business. And of course, of course you want to grow. So I, so I think you, you're absolutely right. And I think what you're doing makes absolute uh, perfect sense. I think often where it tends to veer off into, into craziness is when you have really massive corporations uh, that just, they look at their numbers and say, well, we've got to cut $50 million, so that means we've got to cut, cut labor, and so they, people are working harder and not seeing the gains, and, and meanwhile, the CEO is running off with a couple hundred million dollars. I think you see a lot of the most egregious uh, examples at some of the really large scale. Um, <clears throat> So I, I don't know that I have advice for you. I'd say it sounds like you're doing great work, uh, you know, uh, creating jobs, keeping them going, and you know, living the daily life of a business, which is, is demanding. That's true. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Just to put a finer point on that, would you say part of the structural problem is the gap between the highest paid and the lowest paid employees in a, I, I, in a corporation? I think that that's a very, very good point. That's right. <clears throat> I, think, um, I think if you had, for example, uh, uh, a wage ratio of maybe 10 to 1, uh, even 20 to 1, you wouldn't see the abuses that we're seeing. Um, but um, as we know, CEOs are now being paid hundreds of times more than lowest paid workers. So thank you for that. Uh-huh. Hello. <coughs> I'm uh, Elliot Boyle. I'm a JD candidate here. I have two questions, uh, one related to the principle of financial sustainability you talked about. Uh -huh. I'm wondering um, what the state-owned banks, uh, how, they, how they, they function in that form of 
financial stability? What, what sets them apart? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, as I understand it, the Bank of North Dakota functions um, as a kind of mini Federal Reserve inside the state. <clears throat> it can provide liquidity into the system. Also, what they do is they create a secondary market for loans. So let's say that you have a small local bank that's issuing mortgages, let's say, or uh, business loans. Um, they can then sell those in the secondary market to the Bank of North Dakota, which will hold those loans and, uh, in, uh, uh, for the duration. And meanwhile, the local bank can then get that cash back and go out and loan it again. Because they're local, they know the good businesses, they know the neighborhoods, and they're, they're able to, to do good lending. Uh, and so that's a lot how they function, uh, supporting these, these locally owned banks and allowing them to flourish. Thank you. And the second question I have was related to sustainability. Okay. Principle. And um, have there, are there any examples of people making those moral, moral cases to corporations rather than the financial case? Um, how, how have they gone about that if there are? Well, let, let me give you a slightly different example. This is one that I've written about uh, lately. Um, because the question that animates me right now is what's, what is the design of a corporation that allows moral decision making or even encourages it? Can we, can we envision such a kind of a company? I, I interviewed uh, a company in Maryland called EA Engineering. And this is uh, it's a $140 million environmental consulting firm. It was started by um, uh, Lauren Jensen, who was a professor of limnology, and uh, he started it in the 1970s. He had been mentored by Rachel Carson. So he, he was a true environmentalist. He was an environmental professor. He left uh, his, his university to start a consulting business, and he brought a lot of his graduate students with him, a, a biology and limnologists. And um, they grew very rapidly, because clean air, clean water, all these laws had just passed. And um, all of their advisors, to a person, urged them to go public, which of course everyone thinks that's, that's the brass ring, right? That's, the, that's the, you know, the pot at the end of the rainbow. So he did. He took the company public. Um, he said at first it worked out, and then it turned into a disaster. Um, they cycled through three presidents in a, in a few years. Um, they got in trouble with the SEC uh, for, uh, for cooking the books. For, they had to misstate their earnings, and they saw morale plummet. Because what you had is you had a community made up of, of ecological scientists, right? They cared about doing good work. That was why they were there. And all of a sudden they were being told, no, you need to bring in more contracts. No, you need to like, oh, that project is not working well. Well, let's kind of like cover that up and make it look better on the books. So, so they had these aggressive new CEOs had come in and said, the only thing we care about is making our numbers look good for Wall Street. And, 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 and the mission, the real mission of the company got lost. And, and, and people, were, um, uh, people, people were very depressed. One person I, I visited there, one, one scientist said to me, he said, it's like you sold your soul to Wall Street. Um, Lauren uh, had not cashed out his shares. He stepped in, he bought back that company. He turned it into a 100% employee-owned company. O over time, basically, the employees bought it from him through an ESOP, he didn't give it to them. Um, and he turned it into a, a, a benefit corporation, which it is today. And there's a new, there's a new president now there, Ian McFarlane, uh, and I met with Ian, and he says, you know, we just, we just didn't fit with the public markets. We weren't, we're not that aggressive, you know? We wanna do good work. We don't wanna maximize every, every dime, uh, every quarter. Um, and and it, it's interesting, Ian McFarlane is the CEO now and he is on the board of the Robert Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership. He thinks of himself as a servant leader. He's there to serve his, his workers, serve his, his community, the environment. Uh, and so what I would suggest is that this new ownership design enables and in fact encourages servant leadership, ethical leadership, whereas the old model encouraged unethical leadership. So, so you, you, you asked me, is there an example of moral leadership? Um, that's one, that's one that I see. Um, but yeah, how, how, do you, how do you make this case to corporations? It's something that I think about a lot. I mean, I think that we, we this question of language is difficult, because you can't just barge in on somebody <laughs> and say, oh, you know, forget, 
to get earnings, you need to like save the planet, you know? You can't do that, right? But I think that, but, but if we only speak their language and we never dare to speak our own, haven't we sold ourselves out somehow? And so, and so how, do we, how do we manage to make both those cases? I think that's our challenge. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm a first year JD candidate. Okay. Um, my question is actually slightly related to what you were just talking about. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the process of instilling and fostering and spreading these principles and if uh, government or public policy um, changes therein to those systems mm -hmm. have any part to play sure. in that. Sure, yeah, yes. Um, at the Democracy Collaborative, we like to say that we work in the area of vision models and pathways. I mean, I think first we need a vision. I think a lot of what progressives are for is just very, very siloed, very reactionary, and very isolated. And so, so we're, we're trying to say, let's, let's have a coherent vision of, of a coherent system. And then what are the models? You know, well, the employee-owned benefit corporation, that's a model. <clears throat> the Evergreen Co-ops in Cleveland, that's a model. Um, so we need models, and, and, but then we need pathways. I mean, how the heck do you get there? How do you get from a few nice models to, to be the next system? And I think that, uh, that that's a very big question. Um, and I can't sit here and say that I have a complete blueprint of all the answers. But, um, but, uh, but a few things, um, like, like one of the questions that, um, that comes up is how do you, how do you get, um, the things that we know need to happen for climate change, how do we get those through the federal government? Um, and my colleague, uh, Gar Alprovitz, has come up with this idea of um, what he calls um, quantitative easing for the planet. And his idea is, um, let's buy the oil companies, buy 51% of the oil companies and wind them down. Because they're what's standing in the, in the way of um, he's, you know, we this, he's put together this plan, let's buy the 25 largest fossil fuel companies and begin to wind them down. And use, you know, in the same way that the Federal Reserve created new money to bail out the big banks, we could create new money to, to do this, quantitative easing for the planet. Now, it seems like, it, it seems like a crazy idea, it, it, and it is, but I think we need more crazy ideas. This, this crazy idea, by the way, um, went through a climate change, uh, uh, climate Accelerator. It was run by some funders, and there were uh, something like, I think well, I'm, I want to say 500 ideas submitted, and this was one of one of eight that won. And then it went to uh, was presented to a panel of funders, and it was one of three that received some funding. So people are saying, oh, that's a kind of an out of the box idea. Let's look at that. Um, another out of the box idea that I've seen floated is. Okay, if this, if, if this idea of employee ownership is a good one, how would you get that to scale? And there's one um, uh, investment banker that we work with who, who does a lot of ESOP conversions. He says, you know, if we had a $100 billion loan guarantee from the federal government, we could create 13 million new employee owners in a decade, which is about double what we have today. Uh, and, and a loan guarantee, that doesn't come out of the budget. You don't write a check for that. You're just backstopping the capital, private capital. Uh, and in fact, you get paid for doing so. And $100 billion sounds like a lot, but the Export-Import Bank does that routinely. So it's not, in, in, the, in the face of things, a, a, a huge amount. But the, idea, but, the, but the real problem is we don't have a vision. We don't have a vision that employees, regular people, ought to own things. That's not part of our vision. So there's a couple thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, you were, just to build on that, you were throwing around uh, some pretty big numbers of government spending in sure. this area. And why don't, it would be probably helpful for people if you mm -hmm. contrasted what traditional economic development looks like with government spending and what your vision is for sure. economic development. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question, Melissa. Thank you for that. Um, something like... Um, I think it's about um, $400 billion is spent these days on economic development, luring companies from place to place. That's basically what economic development is, is these days. 
Uh, we had a little meeting last night talking about how we should do some, get some new ideas in, in, in economic development. And I asked this fellow, who's obviously a very nice guy, and I said, so do you ever think about, do you ever, would your colleagues go for it, building assets locally rather than just trying to attack big companies? And he, before the sentence was out of my mouth, he was going like this. It wouldn't fly. It wouldn't fly. Because it, the name of the game is, you know, land Amazon. Land Amazon. You know, there were like a hundred or hundreds of communities battling, battling each other to give money away to Amazon. And we know that Amazon is destroying good jobs in nice little bookstores and turning them into, you know, stock pickers driving up and down a warehouse. Um, that's what Amazon is doing to our communities. And we're, we're throwing money at them. We're competing with each other to attract these jobs because we, instead of uh, developing uh, jobs locally. And you know, we've, we've written reports about this and I've talked to economic development professionals and they're like, well, you know, it's not sexy to say, you know, there's 10 little jobs at this, at this bookstore or there's 20 little jobs at your business. You know, nobody's probably throwing uh, billions of dollars of tax breaks at your business. <laughs> yeah, it would actually. Why don't we give some tax breaks to keep the businesses that we have, the small and medium-sized businesses? Why are we throwing money at these big companies? And, and in fact, um, Missouri and Kansas, I, used to, I, I grew up in Missouri, and uh, um, Kansas City, Kansas, you might know, is on one side of the river, Kansas City, Missouri is on, is on the other side. There's just literally uh, a river in between. Well, Kansas and Missouri have been in a battle luring companies back and forth over the bridge. <laughs> so they'll throw a few million at this company and it'll move over to Missouri and then they'll throw a few million and it'll move back to Kansas. And, and in fact, the governors declared a ceasefire and said, we're going we're gonna to stop doing this, this is crazy. Because then the people would just get in their cars and drive <laughs> over the bridge and go to their job. But you know, lo and behold, Kansas had created jobs by luring these companies. You know, it's a scam. And, um, and so when we talk about $100 billion of loan guarantees, you know, to preserve existing companies and allow founders like you, you know, to realize the value that you've created. It's a hard thing to grow a company. And can you, can you find a buyer? Rural areas in particular have a hard time finding buyers. Um, but if we could, if, if companies could sell it to their employees and get, and get uh, um, assistance in doing so, um, this works out. I mean, those companies, they, they tend to have lower layoffs. They have uh, twice as much wealth for, for employees. Um, you know, it's a, it's a proven model. It's been around for about 30 years. But no, we're not looking at that. We're, we're chasing the Amazons. So again, it's a question of vision. What, what do we think is possible? What do we think we want our economy to look like? We're not there yet. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Bailey. I am a master's student here in environmental law and policy. Great. Um, and I found what you said towards the beginning of the presentation about we about uh, how Trump isn't going to be here forever and we need a plan for after he's gone mm -hmm. to connect very well with something I was reading around the Indivisible Guide, which is a political organizing tool, mm -hmm. saying that the new Democratic majority in Congress might not have that much opportunity to pass meaningful legislation, mm -hmm. but what we do have is the opportunity to figure out what we want to do and use different legislation as like different mm -hmm. models for seeing what might work. Um, and so I was wondering if you think that like legislation or, or it ha could have like a leading or supporting role in creating this new economy or is this something that needs to be primarily private and market based? That's a very perceptive question. I would say all of the above, yes. Um, that I think a lot of this is happening organically in communities. It's happening with business leaders, it's happening with investors. Uh, it's happening with economic development. Community foundations are involved. We work a lot with anchor institutions, large uh, nonprofit hospital systems and colleges that want to anchor, uh, be good anchors in their communities. They want to localize their purchasing. They want to buy from locally owned companies rather than buying it all from some multinational. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it can begin lots of different places and I think it's important that it, it begins lots of places. But it's, if it's gonna go to scale, it's gonna take policy. It's gonna, it's gonna have to involve policy. And, uh, and so what does, that, what does that involve? Well, one um, 
a very intriguing piece of policy that happened recently, amazingly enough, is that um, <clears throat> in the defense bill, there was uh, this little bill called the Main Street Employee Ownership Act got tucked into the defense bill and got passed. Um, both Republicans and Democrats supported it. That's common of, of employee ownership. Ronald Reagan, this is the only uh, uh, policy advance I know that has been favored by both Ronald Reagan and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> That's employee ownership. So this bill uh, said that the, the whole small business, uh, the SBA infrastructure and all of the small business development centers around the country, there's about a thousand of them, must take up employee ownership and start advising people on it and reach out to, to business owners and begin advising them on employee ownership because most people don't know about it. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, there was no funding attached. <laughs> so one of the things we're doing is we're working with these, S these SBDCs to help them figure out how do they get trained um, to, to, to do this. But that's just one example of, of policy. But yes, policy will be needed. And what does that policy look like? I mean, th that's one of the things that we're, that we're working on now. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Emily Donaldson and I'm a JD student here. And uh -huh. I was wondering what your opinion is on environmental social governance ratings. And in addition to the moral, um, the compelling moral arguments for this type of economic transition, what your recommendations would be to the financial services industry in terms of making a more conducive paradigm shift to the new economy? Yeah, great. Um, I, you know, I'm not very conversant on what you said, environmental social governance um, indicators. My partner is here who could probably speak to that. But, um, but what, what I would say is um, that, um, I, you know, I think we need to get some really basic, some really basic moves. We need to get out of fossil fuels. I mean, I think, I think it's most of us, if, if you're lucky enough to have retirement funds, you're probably in index funds, and index funds are all in fossil fuels, which is crazy. So we're all unwittingly participating in the fossil fuel economy. So we, so we need to have, I think, I think um, any uh, living, breathing human being ought to be out of fossil fuels <laughs> as an investment, I guess a start. Um, and then I think we ought to be directing more of our assets toward impact investing, which is, it's not the same as just sort of shuffling the deck between existing publicly traded companies, who rate a little bit better, who rate a little bit worse. We need to do that. But uh, how about investing in, um, in real impact? For example, um, <clears throat> community solar or um, you know, locally owned companies. I know that um, some, some, of the, uh, some pension funds and some uh, foundations are beginning to invest locally. They'll put maybe five, 10 percent. I think Rhode Island Foundation is looking at maybe doing 10 percent of investing locally. You know, if, if our communities are beaten down and we're right here with these pools of billions of dollars, can we invest locally? And the way it's set up now, it's hard to do so. It's really easy to funnel it all through Wall Street. But, but we need to go that extra mile and, and, do, uh, and, and, and start to build the infrastructure to invest locally and, and, and with real impact. That's what I'd like to see. Thank you. Uh -huh. Hi, my name is Bob Buchanan. I, I feel a little bit like an outsider. I'm a New Yorker who lives in, in uh, Vermont. I'm a professor up at Goddard College, often oh. called Little Moscow on the Hill. Okay. So I, I'm just thrilled to hear all that you are talking about. And, and I feel the need to say, as a, a Marxist and a socialist, I, I want to agree with everything uh -huh. that you're saying. But I worry. I don't see the conditions among workers and citizens in this country to be as receptive mm. to the economic programs that you so brilliantly offer mm. to us. Um, I, I wonder why I haven't heard the word socialism from you, because yeah. it really, a lot of what you're saying really sure. rings true there. Um, I haven't heard you talk to us a little bit about unions and them as a force for more progressive yeah. social yeah. change than we see in a lot of uh, places. And I just, and I, I wondered what you're thinking just about the idea of building social movements. Sure. My students are always saying, what do I do? And they feel overwhelmed. And I say, we have to build. Uh -huh. And then we also have to de deconstruct. And I use rhetorical right. words. I say, engines of destruction. Mobile yeah. Exxon is an engine of destruction for right. the planet. And so I, I, at, at the end, I wonder about timing. I don't want to go yeah. on too long. But it just feels like the timing is so tight in terms of the profound ecolo ecological damage right. that 
is with us now and awaits yeah. us. And, and, I, and I wonder how to move the head in the, the fantastic ways that you offer to us. Yeah. I wonder how you struggle with that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I have chosen to avoid the word socialism um, because I have a perception that it won't fly in America. I, I know that it's popular with young people today. I'm not sure that I've made the right choice. Um, I think sometimes people use the word socialism because we've, we've been schooled forever to think there's just two models. There's capitalism and there's communism slash socialism. Those are the two models. And, and, what, and what, what I think is there's actually a, an emerging third, third model. Um, that it's, this, socialism sometimes can connote um, state, the state owns everything. I, I don't think any of us want that exactly, but I think sometimes what it, what it conjectures is, is the state owning everything or all the action being through the state. Um, I, um, I love the socialists who are running for office today and I agree with them just like you agree with me. So it's, just, it's a word, it's just a word. And I try to use words um, that I think um, have, have a chance. And so that it's really just a word choice. Um, but I mean, I think claiming the mantle of democracy has a lot of historical authority. I think it has a lot of gravitas. I think it, democracy has pulled us through a lot over hundreds of years. And it may be the only thing that can, that can pull us through, I think. So, so that's just about words. Um, the other question is, yeah, what about social movements? Um, absolutely, absolutely we need, we need social movements. We, um, at, the, at the Democracy Collaborative, we, we tend to work in economic development and we tend to work with theory. We have not been an organizing institution, which is a different kind of, different kind of institution. We're starting to ask ourselves, you know, do we need to be, to be doing more of that? Uh, how much can one institution do? Absolutely, you need that. I, what, what I will say, um, the most inspiring example I've, this, I've seen is in the UK right now. We have done some work, uh, and this is an example of how this stuff can get into politics. I think we can learn something here. Um, we, we've done some work with a little town called Preston. It's about 140,000 people in England. It's a lot like Cleveland. It was abandoned by industry. It used to be the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, actually, which is interesting. Um, it, was, it was abandoned by, uh, by industry. And um, after the 2008 crisis, they had a big economic development plan. They were going to build a big mall. The whole thing fell apart. And they were left, the city council there was left with nothing. Nothing. They had no vision. They had no, they had no money. They had a broken down economy. They were called the suicide capital of England. That's how bad things were in Preston. There was a city council member there, um, uh, uh, Matthew Brown, uh, who, uh, kind of a regular guy, he'd always, call, always thought of himself as a socialist, and he'd been studying left-wing economics textbooks. He began floating these ideas. He was on city council, and by the way, his city council position was half-time. The other half-time, he worked as a clerk for government, you know, kind of a relatively low-level clerk. And, but he said, well, how about um, we get some anchor institution activity going? How about we do some local investing? How about we do some employee ownership? And he started floating all these ideas. Um, and uh, little by little, they started to catch on. The council was desperate, so they tried some stuff. Um, long story short, Preston has turned itself around uh, it, to a large degree. There was a recent study that just came out last month that said Preston was the most improved city in, in uh, England. And they, they ranked, it was New Economics Foundation did this, they ranked cities the best places to live. Preston ranked above London as a good place to live. Preston is so exciting to England right now, the more, more than 60 communities have come to Matthew uh, and said, how can we do what you're doing? Um, there's at least 10 cities that are trying to replicate what Preston has done. Um, the, the, the Labor Party has created a community wealth building unit uh, my boss, Ted, is part of it. Matthew Brown is part of it. And they're advising labor on this. Labor, the last general election in 2017, was predicted to lose by a landslide. In fact, they came in with 40% of the vote. The conservatives, Theresa May, only got 42%. So only slightly better. And, and the, the, the head of the Labor Party is openly calling himself a socialist. He's using the platform that we talk about, and he calls it socialism. He also calls it a democratic economy. And um, people are saying that, uh, that he could be, labor could be the next government in England. Um, and so we're asking ourselves, oh, this is great. They were sort of inspired by Cleveland. 
Um, and now we're like, we're inspired by Preston and we want to bring it back across the US. But I, I think, um, and, and one of the things that they're talking about, uh, that labor is talking about, they want to privatize, uh, they, no, I'm sorry, uh, it, was, it was conservatives who privatized everything. They want to re-bring into public ownership railways, water, post office, um, and people love this. 77% of people want public ownership of these, of these things. So I think, I think you can build a politics around it. It's, it's starting to happen. Thank you very much. A quick question. Any comments that you want to offer? I, when students come to me and say, where are models of success? I often say, all around the globe, but I often say, look for cooperatives, of yeah, course. Sure. And I say, look for cooperatives where they particularly um, are reaching out to have women being central to the goals and yeah. central to the leadership. And I wondered if that, my notion of that success is, is what you've seen in your own research. And yes, I, I think you're, you're right about that. Some of the most exciting worker-owned cooperatives are with low-income women these days. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Hi, my name's Travis Clark. I'm a 2L here at Vermont Law School. Okay. Thank you for coming. I appreciate yeah. your time. Um, Academics Chris Hedges and Noam Chomsky have suggested that the Democratic Party's abandonment of labor has led to much of the inequality we're experiencing today. Um, my question is, do you anticipate the Democratic Party finding its way back to labor? And would you anticipate that collaboration leading to some of the outcomes you yeah. led us to today? Yeah, I think the Democratic Party needs to find a spine, that's for sure. Um. <laughs> Um, I, I think we have to ally with, with labor. Uh, the, the, the form, former gentleman, I, I forgot to address your concept about labor. A, a number of, of um, uh, labor leaders are saying that uh, the old model of labor is not, is not going to see us through. I, I think we need to preserve it and use it where we can. It's still needed. Um, but there are uh, labor leaders who are starting to say, let's, um, let's uh, create worker co-ops, let's create public ownership of, of this or that. So they're, they're starting to try some different models. I think labor is a, is, a, is, a, is a key player. And also, I will say, there are employee-owned companies that are unionized, and, and they sometimes find that is really, really helpful. I mean, if you have low-income workers who don't know how to speak to a manager and, and advocate for themselves, it's probably good to have, to have a union. Uh, so, there, so I think there's still a place for it. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, and your question was? I was really trying to get an idea of can the Democratic Party succeed without labor, and, and how much does the Democratic Party need to re-embrace the ideals of labor moving forward? Yeah, I, I think it does. I, I think that we need to have, we need to speak for working people, ordinary people, and I think that that's, I think that's what's been lost, and that's why, that's why we have, um, someone who's pretending to care about working people has one has one office so i think you're absolutely right we, we need we need labor and we need we need to be working for working people mm -hmm. uh -huh. hi thanks for being here i have two questions but they're short okay um i also was struck by your statement that labor needs to come before capital um and i understand labor to mean in this context people's time but also their capabilities their yeah interests. Uh -huh. can you say briefly what you know what things you um, understand capital to mean in this context yeah by capital I mean um, um, you know the one percent and ten percent who hold most of the assets I mean the stock market something like eighty percent of the stock market wealth is held by the wealthiest 10%. So when you're working for shareholders, you're working for capital. When you're working, when the one one percent is holding most of the assets, that's that's capital. So that that's how I mean it. It's wealth, wealth holders. Sure. Um, my second question is, I'm really interested in the lean movement, um, which is not uh, not a way to address or change capitalism, but I think it is a way to. Um, refocus businesses on um, labor and employees. And I wonder, I just wondered if you'd heard of that, and if so, if you have any thoughts about I, I'm not familiar with that. You don't mean lean in. You mean lean manufacturing? 
Yeah, like mean, lean manufacturing and assets being applied to other industries like healthcare, um, famously, and even education and other areas. I don't think I can speak to that. I'm not real familiar with it, but thanks for the question. Thank you. Sure. Okay, looks like we have um, exhausted everyone's <laughs> questions, so I will, I will uh, ask the final closing question. Okay, sure. And that is, um, what would you recommend to all the students gathered here in terms of how to prepare themselves to play a role in this, um, in advising employee-owned yeah. businesses or moving uh, uh -huh. from the uh, capital from baby boomer owned businesses into employee owned structures. How would you advise that they prepare themselves to participate if they're inspired to do so after this? Sure, sure. Well, I think um, that's a great question for a group of people who are working in, in law. <clears throat> and I know some of you are working just in the masters. And I think, as I mentioned, I, I myself have worked in enterprise design, advising uh, company owners. So you don't have to be a lawyer to do this. I always work with a lawyer. But um, you know, we, we did some work on what's, what's missing. Why isn't there more employee ownership? Um, in this country? Why has it been relatively stagnant for a couple of decades? And we found a few things missing. One is um, awareness. Most business owners aren't aware of it. Um, they're just, they're not aware of it as an option that there's great tax breaks for selling to employee-owned companies. You can defer your capital gains taxes. The company itself, if it's employee-owned, um, and it's an S-corp so that it passes the taxes through. It, can, it pays zero taxes at the enterprise level, income taxes. The taxes are paid by workers when they uh, withdraw their holdings from the trust and when they're retired. It's an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary sentence in place. Um, people aren't aware of it and they don't, know, they don't know that it works. They think it sounds kind of weird, you know. Um, so I think helping to build awareness. And a lot of what's missing, what we found is part of that awareness that's missing is advisors don't know about it. Attorneys, accountants retirement professionals, they're not telling people about it because they themselves don't know about it. Um, and so I think, um, you know, we need professionals in all of these, all of these services to be, to be up to speed on this. Um, and um, another piece that we found was missing, uh, two pieces I'd say. One is uh, there's agency is missing. Employees can't buy their own companies. They don't usually have the money. Um, employee, owners don't know about it. Advisors are not really telling people. So where are the, who's moving this forward? Um, we think that capital can really be a major agent in moving this forward. But there's money to be made. Uh, so we, we, there's one um, um, private equity firm that we're uh, advising, strategic advisors to them. They do exclusively ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans. They have $160 million fund. Uh, and they're making high teens returns for their investors by, by financing ESOPs. So uh, there's money to be made here. Too. And um, so, um, and of course, it benefits communities. And so, I think advising mayors and economic development that, you know, here's an option. You instead of just chasing these out of town companies, let's keep the companies that we have. We're going to lose a couple of million companies in the next 10 years if we're not careful. And that's going to harm mayors, it's going to harm communities. Let's keep the ones that we have. And we need people who are, are, um, are, are educated about this and, and spreading, spreading the word. Great. Well, thank you everyone for coming and thank, thank you. you to Marjorie. Hi. Appreciate it.